Dear guests, dear colleagues, good morning. Welcome to deba the debate uh, Back to Our Future, regions leading Europe's green recovery, uh, organized by the, in the framework of the EU Green Week uh, 2021. Uh, and on behalf of AER and our Euro Task Force on Climate, it is my pleasure to moderate this debate on such an important topic for local and regional authorities. Climate change is one of the greatest and most urgent challenges facing the world today. The European Union has adopted leading targets to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. The, this ambition is at the heart of the European Green Deal and in line with the Paris Agreement. It is clear that a just transition to a climate neutral economy and society requires integrated strategies at local, regional, national, European and global level, as well as joint action by all levels of government and actors. Local and regional authorities are on the front line of climate change, responding to the, this uh, emergency through a wide range of mitigation, adaptation policies and investments. It is therefore vital that the role of region, regional governments is in delivering the green transition toward climate neutrality is recognized. This means that national governments, European institutions and international bodies must work closely with regional authorities in the formulation and implementation of climate strategies. The COVID-19 recovery is also an opportunity to build a better, greener and more resilient future. Uh, an opportunity to put our territories on the path to, a, to meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement and the Agenda 2030. But if this is to happen, the European and national investments and recovery plans must be in line with the local priorities and needs and translate into funding to regions to undertake actions that support a fair transition to a climate neutral economy and society. In this spirit of collaboration, I would like to warmly thank our guest speakers and all the local and regional representatives and partners for joining us here today. I, I hope that uh, you will enjoy the next hour and a half of debate and I look forward to your participation. So please share your comments and the questions. For that you can either raise your hand during the Q&A or use the chat function uh, on the right hand of your screen and type your comments and questions uh, in there and we will bring them to up during the Q&I. Uh, we want to make this event as interactive as possible so we have pre prepared a few polls and questions for, for you uh, by using Slido and, and I would like to ask the Secretariat to put, put up the slide where the instructions on how to join the conversation and you can find, you, you can use your mobile phone, tablet or computer. First, you need to open your browsers and write slido.com. And there you can, you need to enter the event code uh, for our event or scan the QR code uh, uh, with your mobile phone. And when you manage to do this, you will have a question and the question will be, when you think about climate change, what word comes into your mind? So I will give you a little. Let's see what happens.
We're starting to see the word cloud to form, and uh, I think we there's a lot of different uh, words, of course, but I see both um, emergency, emergency and, and action are on two of the biggest uh, words here. It is great to see that you are very engaged and have a lot of questions and uh, ideas about what you think about when it comes to climate uh, climate uh, change. It's not just emergency, it's also action. And action is actually right now the biggest word. And that sounds very good for, for the <laughs> upcoming uh, debate. Okay. Perhaps this was uh, could start in how to use the Slido um, tool, and it will come back uh, a few times during this uh, event. So now let's go to <coughs> to uh, <coughs> let me to introduce to you to our first speaker, Veronika Hunt Shafrankova, uh, head of. Uh, United Nations uh, Environmental uh, Program in, in the Brussels office. And um, the question I will ask <laughs> is, speaking to member states during the preparations toward the, the COP26, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that 2021 is crucial, is a crucial year in the fight against climate change on uh, make or break year to fulfill the Paris Agreement. So, Ms. Uh, Safrankova, why is 2021 so important to address the climate emergency? And what are the UN priorities as we look towards the COP26? 20, uh, and in your perspective, how is the COVID-19 pandemic and recovery changing the outlook for the green transition? Thank you very much and good morning to all. <clears throat> it's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, these are very important questions and I'll try to be brief because uh, I'm uh, very privileged to be a speaker, but I'm also keen listeners. So I'm also looking forward to hear uh, your views and experience and plans uh, for the future. And it was very encouraging to see in the poll that uh, most of you actually uh, see uh, the first word is action. So that's, uh, that's very encouraging for this debate uh, today. So I would just uh, st uh, start with framing uh, with a little uh, data uh, insight. Uh, as we all know uh, from the last year's emission gap report, despite the brief dip in carbon dioxide emissions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the world is still heading for a temperature rise in excess of three degrees this century, which is far beyond the Paris Agreement goals. Um, we also saw uh, last year and the state of the global climate 2020 by the World Meteorological Organization showed uh, that uh, the, the global warming of 1.2 degrees is already having damaging impacts everywhere. And we saw it uh, in Europe, we saw it uh, at the beginning of this year in February in Belgium, if we are talking about uh, our closest environment, we had uh, temperatures above 20 degrees in February, followed two weeks later snow so we can see it everywhere um, so it is uh, the 2020 was uh, unprecedented year for extreme weather events and climate disaster including record greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission concentrations increasing land and ocean temperatures sea level rise melting ice and so on uh, we uh, elena i'm sure will talk about uh, the uh, eu adaptation uh, action plan, uh, which also uh, is looking at the EU perspective, but also the international dimension to that. But I would like to point out also that the, the climate is indeed uh, uh, the topic of, of this year, but uh, uh, we also have to look at it uh, in the connection of the other planetary crises, uh, which are very much interconnected, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. And I would like to uh, uh, cite some numbers from the uh, a recent uh, synthesis report, Making Peace with Nature, which is indeed looking at the 
connectivity between these uh, different crises. And I would just remind how urgent all these are. Uh, over the last 50 years, the global economy has grown nearly fivefold, you, you, uh, largely to uh, tripling extraction and of natural resources and energy. Um, that has uh, fueled growth in production and consumption. The world population has increased uh, by a factor of two, so uh, 7.8 billion people. Um, and uh, though on average prosperity has uh, also doubled, about 1.3 billion people remain poor. So these numbers are very alarming and also in the context of climate change uh, and adaptation, uh, the, uh, the, the population, and you see it uh, uh, where you are from regions and local authorities that it is very much a problem uh, on, on all levels. Uh, what is clear that due, uh, is that due to the interconnected uh, nature of the climate change, biodiversity loss, land degradation, and air and water pollution means that they must be addressed together, as I mentioned, but to maximize benefits and also minimize trade-offs. And therefore, both the COP26 on climate that uh, we mentioned uh, earlier today and also COP15 on biodiversity that is taking place later this year in October in Kunming are extremely important. So on the COP26 in Glasgow, it is an uh, opportunity for the last highest level political push for enhanced national determined contributions, ambitions, and for securing and solidifying climate neutrality targets from high uh, emitting countries. This is uh, very much needed to lay out the necessary ambition for the next round of the national determined uh, contributions and keep the two degrees goal alive. The second point I would mention in relation to COP26 is advancing progress on climate finance. And it's very encouraging to see the US uh, coming back to financing gold climate funds, but uh, the ambition needs to step up everywhere. Uh, increase uh, finance on adaptation. Again, I think it will be probably covered uh, later on with other speakers. I would, remind that at the 2021 Climate Adaptation Summit, the UN Secretary General called for 50% of total share of climate finance provided by all donors and multilateral development banks to be allocated to adaptation and resilience. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, uh, to, to demonstrate uh, how adaptation has been lagging behind the mitigation uh, financing, uh, despite the grow uh, in, in, in the last year, the gap is still not closing. And we see it in the uh, 2020 adaptation gap report that the uh, total adaptation finance is currently only 5% of total climate finance. So that's uh, not much at all. I'm sure Elena will agree with me that uh, there we need really to step up the, the finance in the climate adaptation. Uh, also, uh, adaptation mitigation win-wins. Uh, especially nature and cooling to reduce tension around low adaptation funding. Uh, one of the uh, solutions uh, are nature-based solutions for adaptation that are very often low cost options that bring environmental, economic and social benefits to wide range of stakeholders. Of course, mitigation finance uh, also needs to be uh, at, the, at the high level and should not be reduced because of the uh, high demands for adaptation. Uh, but uh, more mitigation limits uh, adaptation needs and climate damages and losses. Um, and uh, last point on the finance is that also providing the enabling conditions for private sector investments in climate action uh, is needed since full economic approach is very much needed for the transformation. And now going to the COVID-19 recovery question. Uh, inclusion of transparent, uh, transparency measures to ensure COVID-19 recovery investments are aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, the, the question, I think, was uh, how the COVID pandemic and recovery changing the outlook for the green transition. So uh, very few words uh, on that. Um, we all hear and, uh, and see that the COVID-19 recovery spending is an opportunity for governments uh, to chart a new course for green transition. Uh, the green recovery could cut 25% of uh, 2030 emissions, putting the world on track to the 2%, the uh, two, 2 degrees uh, pathway. Nevertheless, uh, the last uh, numbers that we have seen uh, from the Global Recovery Observatory report that is indeed looking at, uh, at, uh, at this, uh, if we are on the track in the green recovery, the conclusion is 
no, we are not on track, track yet in uh, building back better, greener. The spending announced in 2020 paints a disappointing picture for the overall efforts so far to build forward with green priorities. In 2020, only 18% of recovery spending and 2.5% of total spending had positive green characteristics. And I really stress the word positive because uh, we learned that very often benefits of spending are neutralized by harms. For instance, approximately 16% of recovery spending may bring positive air pollution impact, but 16.4% uh, may act to increase net air pollution. So we really have to be careful looking at uh, the benefits uh, here. And it's also now uh, looking at the, the, uh, the individual national uh, recovery plans, how uh, they really will contribute to, to, to the green recovery. Uh, what also is important to learn from the past, uh, past experience that spending policies are alone not sufficient and we have to look and follow with reforms that address key market failures in pricing externalities such as removing environmentally harmful subsidies, for example, for fossil fuels or unsustainable agricultural practices. So um, I'm coming to an end because I've been talking for quite a long time, but uh, what is important in the COVID-19 context is that we need to translate green funding into effective stimulus policies. Some of the most economically effective stimulus policies are the very same policy that will lead us towards uh, decarbonization and improvements in pollution and, and nature loss. They will also help to address the global and domestic inequalities that contribute both to economic, uh, economic social and environment uh, a sustainable future. Uh, what is really important is that leadership of countries and industries uh, uh, keep uh, driving the green transition process, but it's uh, applicable to all levels. But for example, both public and private actors may decide to steer away from polluting activities focused on carefully designed green economic policies that de deliver the social and economic co-benefits. So there is uh, a lot of uh, work to do on all levels and of course regional and uh, local authorities play an extremely important role in, in this process. And we also should be looking at uh, not only um, constraining industries to accept regulations, but for the next, uh, let's say 30 years, we should also, uh, it should be about economic and social opportunities that can be achieved through aligning business models with nature positive and gender equality mission that uses renewable energy, but also resource biodiversity and aims for gender equal employment practices that moves us fully to circular economy. And that's where I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shavrankova. And uh, um, I think we'll directly will go to our next slide. Uh, and so we have another question to our participants. Do you agree that Europe uh, should have a target of net zero emissions by uh, 2050. So let's see what the slider says. It seems like we are agreeing <laughs> so far. I, I think this is the result we will get on, on this question, actually. So, so let's go to our next speaker. So I would like to, now to turn to uh, Ms. Elena Vishnar Malinkovska, uh, head of the unit for adaptation, uh, Directorate General for Climate Action, European Commission. And, and the question to Ms. Vishnar, Malinkovska, uh, when introducing the European Green Deal, President von der Leyen described it as Europe's man on the moon movement, movement, recognizing that to succeed, this ambitious plan would need to ensure that the transition makes, uh, takes place in a just manner so that no regions and sectors are left behind. So 
Can you please share with us how uh, are the initiatives pro um, proposed by the European Commission getting the regions on board on this ambitious trip to the moon? Thank you very much, Magnus. And it's always a pleasure to, to speak after Veronica because she created a nice bridge uh, to my intervention. But first of all, I wish to bring you to the moonshot uh, because we all definitely remember uh, the, uh, the first man on, uh, on the moon. But we also do remember the Apollo 13 mission that didn't make it to the moon, that had to uh, circle the moon and, and get back uh, on, uh, on, on the mission. And, and this is exactly what we would like to, to avoid with uh, the Green Deal. Allow me to say what the Green Deal is in terms of these moonshots, because we often uh, talk about the net zero in such a confident manner, but there are other very important uh, objectives that are coupled with this, like the zero pollution, which means uh, no uh, pollution of our water, soils, of air. Um, UNEP, uh, that uh, Veronica leads here in Brussels, has launched the uh, restoration decade of ecosystems, which will just show us how much we've lost in the past. And we want to, you know, create within this Green Deal a, a certain harmony between the different objectives that may be conflicting and, and where a lot of trade offs can arise as we want to go uh, towards uh, the, the net zero. So I want you the, the moonshot to visualize the moonshot in two numbers, for instance, just for the um, emissions, CO2 emissions, and it's zero, plain zero, and it's 51 billion of tons of CO2 that are added annually to our atmosphere. Whatever happened in the past on economic activities, be it COVID or be it the economic crisis, it's still the drop was not sufficient to bring us really on the path to zero. So now is my call to all the regions, please come on board of the spaceship. We need you. And the important ingredients for you to be on board are the following. First of all, strategic frameworks. In many regions of Europe, we had green climate, uh, clean energy strategies. And what is good now, we have this supported also uh, by a bold vision of the Green Deal that becomes the main priority uh, for the future spending. We've seen some of the regions adopting already climate laws where they translate these strategic frameworks into something where the citizens can bring you to the court. Uh, second, planning. Uh, this is an ancient art. You always need to be part of a planning exercise so that you align your budgets accordingly. And we had recently a lot of these planning exercises going on, starting with the national energy and climate plans, for instance, the recovery plans that are now uh, being prepared, or the just transition fund plans. And regions need to be brought you know, into these planning exercises and express their needs. Third, engagement. And this is not an empty word for me, uh, allow me to say so, because as for the climate law, we as the Commission have the obligation to engage with all levels, national, regional, local, to check on how we are doing towards the climate neutrality uh, in 2030, in 2040, uh, and, and we will be you know, uh, held responsible for not engaging uh, sufficiently. Fourth, funding. Uh, yesterday, the Commission released uh, its uh, draft budget for 2022, but also a performance assessment of the budget. In the past financing periods, at least 20% were used for climate action of the budget, 8% for biodiversity. But if you look at sustainable development goals, 
as many as 46 programs of the Commission have contributed at least to one of the sustainable development goals. This is terrific news, of course, and this should, not only on paper, but also on the ground, uh, provoke uh, some sort of difference. Now, allow me to, 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 to outline three big, uh, let's say, projects uh, where I think uh, the regions must be at the table. First of all is, is the recovery. As we are now uh, finalizing uh, the plans, I have high hopes that the region's needs have been translated into the recovery plans that member states proudly submitted to Brussels. There are the 37% of the plans that really need to go towards green needs, and hopefully this will tick also the boxes that Veronica mentioned of a socially just transition and economic opportunities, because a lot of these areas should indeed uh, produce local jobs, be it in water management, in uh, green spaces uh, creation, uh, be it in data analytics, in environmental consultancies, in research and innovation. Second, the Just Transition Fund, and, and this is really a, a very important one. Uh, I am participating uh, to, uh, you know, following this process for the country I know the best, uh, Slovakia. And we've realized a few points here. First of all, it is very difficult to visualize the green economy. We have already uh, invented the Homo Digitalis. We know how Homo Digitalis looks like. What does it mean maybe in education? We still struggle to say who is the Homo Ecologicus and how you know, a, a green, uh, green uh, economy looks like in local surroundings. And many times in preparing these uh, transitions, we have to rely on incumbents, on strategies of the big economic players that are in the regions. And they are not very creative always because they follow also the you know, uh, status quo uh, perspectives. So here, uh, really, uh, my plea to, to regions, be creative, be inventive, and involve your youth in uh, preparation of these transitions, because they will be uh, the, the future of the region. Don't let them go from, from the region, but please involve them. And I've seen um, terrific transition uh, projects uh, from some countries like Slovenia, where they have converted a mercury-dependent region into uh, a region of the future. And finally, as we know, the climate impacts are discriminatory. They will hit the poor more, the poor regions more. They will add to the constraint that is already out there in the region, be it uh, youth in employment or very sluggish uh, growth. And here uh, we have prepared for, for such regions, for such vulnerable regions, the other <laughs> moonshot, the so-called mission on adaptation and societal transformation. Let me explain. This is a novel approach in research and innovation because we do see that we cannot just uh, go by incremental changes in policies or in solution making, but we really need to make a big jump. And here, the, this mission on the Horizon Europe is meant to help the most vulnerable regions to prepare the climate risk assessments, to prepare the roadmaps as to how to deal with, uh, with risks, to see what are the most sensitive sectors uh, to climate change. And as we know, uh, it's not just the coal mining regions or the carbon intensive regions. You have a lot of regions depending on agriculture, tourism or fisheries or even energy. Uh, that will be um, that will be uh, harmed. We want to uh, promote a little bit of experimentation 
with citizens because it must be fun and it must really go from the technocratic space of climate policy making into something that uh, people do embrace. So there will be some competitions between the regions and of course we need demonstrations. We need to show on the ground that these solutions, uh, like Veronica mentioned, the na natural uh, solution, nature-based solutions, or the organizational changes can work. They are just not the talk of, of technocrats, but they can be uh, tested on, on the ground. So here, really, region, stay tuned in and don't hesitate to already create networks with universities with your local patriots if i may say so with your youth so that you are ready uh, for the landing of the mission on adaptation so that within the next uh, few years we we have a uh, real project to roll out across europe thank you so much Ms. Vishnar. Uh, Malinovska uh, for your guiding to, to us from the regional level and um, yes we will go to the slido again so uh, let's try to answer um, this question what's the biggest challenge for, for the Green Deal? Yes, we're starting to see. So far, we can really see that the strongest word is commitment. Financing is also bolded. Yes, political leadership and awareness. Thank you for, for your comments. And uh, let me now introduce Mr. Dominique uh, Riquet, uh, member of the European Parliament and rapporteur on the opinion of the Committee of uh, Transport and Tourism on the Just Transition Fund. So my, my question is, the European Parliament supported the Green Deal and pushed for an even higher ambitions, uh, underlining that the green transition should be uh, turned into uh, economic and social opportunity for all regions of Europe. In your opinion, on the Just Transition Fund, you have also made it clear that the funding is needed to enable regions to address the social, economic and environmental impacts on the transition and narrow uh, regional disparities. Also based on your experience, as a formal local and regional elected representative, do you feel, um, Mr. Rike, that uh, the new e EU legislation, strategies and funding we have now and that are to emerge uh, are going to be enough to effectively uh, support national, regional and local governments to achieve the green transition ambitions? Thank you for inviting me and uh, good morning, uh, everybody. It's a, a very good and very difficult question because uh, what you are asking to me, what is sufficient? Uh, I, I couldn't swear uh, nothing is sufficient. Uh, the, the, the deal is very, very high and very difficult. One just first remark to do during the pandemic, European regions have been on the front line providing emergency services, opening test centers, allocating patients to hospital, organizing mobility services. Uh, during the current recovery phase, they are mobilized to address the social and economic consequence of the crisis by implementing national recovery plans. This shows their agility and adaptability and under challenging circumstances, but also their financial, regulatory, and management capabilities. It was as, a, as an examination 
In this regard, uh, the lessons learned from the COVID crisis also apply to the uh, green transition, I think. The crisis reminded us the evidence of the region's expertise regarding the needs and particularities of European coordination. Indeed, regions have a long-standing experience in the management of European programs, in particular in the frameworks of the cohesion policy, which is mental until now. Depending on the program and the type of management, they are often in charge of uh, funneling uh, European funds and of selecting projects and businesses that will benefit from uh, European funding, uh, particularly through structural funds, which is significant part of the European budget. Uh, we can easily anticipate that the regional level will be more important than ever with the upcoming publication of the Fit for 55 package uh, to deliver the Green Deal, which will not come without social, economic, and environmental consequences for European region at first. The objective of reaching climate neutrality by 2050 is being integrated across all sectoral policies related to transport industry, energy, or building, for example. However, this ambitious target requires a transition to a low carbon economy impacting all sectors and is challenging for regions relying mostly on fossil fuel and carbon intensive industry. The risk of leaving certain communities behind is growing. Already, there is a disparity across Europe when it's come to the readiness and ability to shift to a sustainable economy. The pandemic has only aggravated an already existing problem concerning, concerning inequality between European regions, and most governments were far beyond from achieving the previously established environmental goals. Many rich Western countries have a significant amount of renewable energy capacity and transport policies focused on investment fostering the development of flu or zero emission solutions. While those in Central and Eastern Europe are reliant on coal, both for power and jobs. To take us a divide and create a socially fair shift toward a green economy, we wanted the creation of the, just, of the Just Transition Fund, for example, and at least we, uh, we channel at least 30% uh, of the recovery plan uh, toward the green economy, and we will remain very attentive for the regional fund also. Therefore, in that, in that uh, forecast provision, the uh, European region will need to play a key role. First, in drafting of legislation delivering the Green Deal, the Green Deal to make sure that the text take into account territorial differences with different starting points with regards to their energy, transport, and industrial policies. I believe this bottom-up approach should be reinforced further in the European decision-making process and associations like yours have a clear role to play in this regard. Then in the implementation of this new legislation by adapting it to local economic and social needs due to the unique knowledge of the local particularities of each territory. In addition to the upcoming legislation, leveraging to existing cohesion policy to deliver on the target set by the Green Deal is also the responsibility of local and regional authority at first. Even in countries like France or Germany, the transition will not be the same across regions and therefore needs have to be tailored, made for each of them in coordination with them. The geographical, economic and social diversity of European regions require ambition, ambitious financial support for them, 
and also the national strategies to reach climate neutrality by uh, 2050 are being designed and adapted for each region in particular. To conclude, I remain convinced that the success of the Green Deal will depend on the ability to tailor legislation, both at the drafting and implementing, and implementing stage to the local needs without having any region lagging behind. In addition, more needs to be done to effectively support national and local governments already laying behind to achieve region, the green transition. Finally, when you are asking to me if we uh, have enough legislation strategy, I will ask well, probably we uh, have in general enough legislation and in general, also enough strategy. It's a, a, another a question about funding, because I think that the needs for funding are absolutely huge. And uh, it's more difficult after the pandemic because we have also an economic recovery on the desk. And I think that at first, we need to be very voluntary about funding and to make choice and to channel our, our money in a good direction. And so, uh, to have a good cooperation between the local level, regional level, national and European one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reke. And we will uh, go to our next Slido. And we have one more question to our participants. When it comes to uh, dealing with issues related to climate change, who are who has the biggest responsibility? So this is a... This will be very interesting to see. So far, the national governments are at the top level. I think they're even increasing a little bit. Business sector, number two, local and regional governments on the third place and individuals on the fourth place. Yes, I think that's the result of, of this poll uh, for now. Thank you for participating. And um, we have now got um, messages from the UN, from the European uh, Commission and from the European Parliament. Let's go to the uh, Committee of Regions. So our next speaker, Mr. Andreas uh, Griffroy, is member of the Committee of Regions and rapporteur on the European Green Deal. And uh, my question uh, to Mr. Griffroy is um, in an opinion adopted in December last year, the Committee of Regions emphasized the role of local and regional authorities in achieving the ambitious uh, ambitions of the Green Deal and driving the transition to a sustainable climate neutral Europe. Why is the role of local and regional authorities in the green recovery and transition so important? And from your experience, what are the biggest challenges that will face that process? And uh, what do you think the Green Deal is? Is it a credible plan to achieve a green recovery and transition in your regions, in our regions, cities and villages? Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Dear members of the Assembly of the European Regions Bureau, dear friends and colleagues, it is with a great pleasure to take part in this meeting to discuss about the Green Deal and role of regions in green recovery. The European Green Deal provides a great opportunity to support the sustainable recovery while making the European Union more competitive and resource efficient. This discussion is very topical as through the European Union Recovery Plan. Next generation Euro Euro European Union, the financial resources will shortly be made available 
to accelerate the transition to climate neutrality. I'm sure I do not have to convince you on the crucial role local and regional authorities play in the re green recovery. The multitude of innovative initiatives and projects carried in the regions and cities we represent with the Committee of the Regions show it very clearly. Sustainable mobility plans, energy efficient buildings, circular economy, nature-based solutions and urban greening plans and so on and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, the size and scale of the effort that needs to be undertaken requires the full support of all levels of government and across all sectors of our society. The Green Deal is a credible plan per se, but to make it work, it must support an approach that is bottom-up, balanced and targeted. Bottom-up because the Green Deal cannot be successful without taking on board local and regional authorities, actors that implement actions on the ground and that represent the closest level of governance to the citizen. Balanced, because the solutions we uh, identify today will have to respond to a world that is increasingly complex. They will have to address environmental, economic and social challenges, while considering asymmetric impact of the pandemic, regional imbalances and taking into account the specific needs on the ground energy mix which remain extremely uh, diverse. It has to be targeted because all themes that the European Union Green Deal encompasses from renovation of buildings, air pollution, sustainable farming, restoring biodiversity, provide fertile ground for cost-effective integration of new and existing plants across sectors. The Green Deal must focus on innovation and measures that allow for greater carbon emission reductions at a lower cost and prioritize actions with more job creating potential. In this way, we can achieve a transition that is green, just and affordable for citizens and business. In this context, the European Committee of the Regions, in the opinion, the assessment of the European Green Deal, the impact of the climate change in uh, regions, on which I was rapporteur, adopted recommendations to ensure regions and cities can play a meaningful role in the delivery of the Green Deal objectives. These recommendations concern three areas, governance, funding, and monitoring mechanism. The first is bottom-up governance. As you know, more than 70% of the climate change mitigation, up to 90% of adaptation measures are undertaken by local and regional authorities. And they are responsible for more than 65% of climate and environment related public investments. Several regions and cities have adopted local green deals or energy transition plans and integrated sustainable development goals in the long-term strategies. However, their input and contributions are seldom reflected in the national plans drawn up in the European Union capitals. Local and regional authorities should be able to participate in a structured manner in the design and implementation of national plans related to the green deal, including the recovery and the resilient plans in accordance with the bottom-up approach and partnership principle. To address this issue, we propose to establish permanent multi-level platforms in all areas of the Green Deal to ensure mandatory consultation of local and regional authorities. Second point is the funding. The European Union Long-Term Budget and Recovery Fund play a fundamental role in supporting the objective of climate neutrality as a big share of the resources. Have to be allocated 30 to 37% for sustainable investments to accelerate the transition. However, the centralized governance of the recovery instrument is a serious matter of concern. Despite the regulation on recovery and resilience facility obliges central governments to consult with different stakeholders, there has been evidence that in several member states, local and regional authorities have not been adequately involved in the process leading to the definition of the most national plans. This is unacceptable, as local and regional authorities are the ones who will have eventually to implement projects on the grounds and in many sectors they have direct competence and also they are used to manage to managing cohesion policy funds. This will be critical for the success and uptake of key initiatives such as the Renovation Reef, to name just one, for example, where we as European Union aim at doubling the renovation rate by 2030 and renovate 35 million buildings in the coming decades. 
For this reason, we believe that more opportunities should be created for cities to get easier and more direct access to funding and in accordance to clear principles and standards. Moreover, more advisory tools and support should be granted to the local actors in the implementation of projects to address knowledge gaps. The third is then monitoring. To ensure the Green Deal is a true opportunity to foster a green recovery while aiming to climate neutrality, the implementation on the ground of plans and measures need to be substantiated by transparent, accountable results. But when actions are not measured, they are not valued. When they are not valued, they are overlooked. Several monitoring systems <clears throat> already exist, but they are not sufficiently coordinated with each other. Therefore, we propose to develop a regional European scoreboard to track progress on climate and Green Deal legislation, policies and financing at regional level. And I'm very pleased the European Commission, in its recently published Zero Pollution Action Plan, has announced the intention to work with the Committee of the Regions on regional scoreboard to assess green performance of regions. And regional indicators could also provide evidence of the progress in the implementation of the recovery plans locally, and could also serve as a knowledge tool to help represent the diversity of territories' needs and identify and replicate best practices. So what's next? What can we do together? I think the upcoming Fit for 55 package to publish in July, which will set out a legal track to deliver on new climate neutrality targets, as well as the implementation of the European Union recovery plan, will be the first test for the delivery of the Green Deal and to assess its capacity to reality to really fit the needs of territory. We must ensure, with the help with the European Commission, that local and regional authorities are fully involved in the package. Their role and competences are acknowledged and that diversity of needs and starting points are reflected in flexible approach while maintaining the necessary level of ambition. We must work together to open a structural dialogue with member states to involve more regions and cities in the implementation of project finance under the recovery funds. And this is an area where we can work together to build back a better and greener future. In conclusion, the Green Deal can become the best possible tool for the implementation of a sustainable climate neutral Europe. The goal can only be reached through open consultative processes across the level of government and by allowing the local and regional level to drive forward the green recovery with the appropriate tools. Will the level platforms to deliver structured inclusive planning and implementation of the recovery plans? Stable regulatory frameworks and direct access to funding, very important, to contribute to the implementation of the SDGs and the Paris, Paris Agreement driven by local needs and context, and an European regional scoreboard with clear indicators to track process of the Green Deal at the regional level. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present the main points of the opinion. I hope we can work together to follow up on this recommendation and to make sure the Green Deal is built bottom up with the necessary support and collaboration of regions and cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Griproy. And uh, thank you all speakers. You are really giving us uh, interesting perspectives uh, from the moon and back. So we have a lot to discuss. So I would like to open uh, the debate. So please raise your hand and or use the chat function if you want like to make a comment or ask a question to our speakers. So um, we will invite you to, to share challenges, uh, the re green recovery and transition uh, present to your regions, as well as your strategies uh, towards the green transition and also the development uh, for you need to do to um, uh, for, for, need from the European Union and the national governments to make the transition happen in, in your regions. And, and we have contributions from several representatives and, and I would like to, to, to invite them to take the floor. So, so could I perhaps start by inviting Mr. Arno Keralt, uh, directory, uh, director of the advisory Council for Sustainable Development at the Government of Catalonia to, to take the floor. And I, I need to tell you all, please keep it short so we will have time for a lot of, uh, a lot of 
different um, messages here. So, Mr. Anoa. So, thank you very much, Magnus. I will, I, I will be short. So, the point is uh, for for us, um, the European Green Deal, but also all funds uh, related to the to, to the post-COVID recovery, are crucial for accelerating this indigen. The point is that we are already know know uh, knew about. I mean, I think that all of us were aware of the the impacts of climate change and, and the different challenges we had on the agenda. Science, scientists came uh, with clear messages and, and, you, and I think that we are reaching some tipping points. And now the time has arrived from, from taking, I mean, for being aware of the, uh, the, the difficult moment that we are facing as humanity, but also as you. So welcome the European Green Deal. Uh, regions were already committed to the ecological transition. Uh, I think that we have many, many examples, but the point is that uh, we are, uh, from our perspective in Catalonia, we are working very hard in order to um, introduce uh, sustainable principles in all our policies. This is why we are working on this, the circular economy uh, roadmap that will follow the, obviously all the, the points, including the, in, the, in the European Commission uh, uh, circular economy plan. We are also working on the, a new industrial plan that will take, uh, that will consider all the, the, the recommendations and the main messages coming from the industrial, uh, the European Commission industrial strategy. We already approved a national plan for food before the approval of the before the approval of the of from part to four, but I think that finally we made the link within the different strategies because we are we need to have this transversal vision and this long long term vision, and and the point is that uh, we need I mean some messages we need more innovation we need also uh, training we need to have I mean we need to prepare our workers and our students this, I mean. Uh, future workers in order to be ready to 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 be part of this engine and obviously we need some funding and this is why this is important we have some mechanisms as, like the new uh, the new co2 uh fund uh that will that is that will be funded by the co2 tax uh implemented thanks to the to the following the the implementation of the catalan climate law but we need especially these European funds to, to accelerate our plans, some plans that we already had in the future, in the past, sorry. Uh, Magnus, uh, you, you, you asked me to be short. Hopefully oh, please, continue, continue. Okay, <laughs> perfect. No, but here the point is how we are, I mean, one of the things that, that uh, I'm personally think is that we need to be, absolutely aware of the, the, the urgency. I mean, because I, I started by mentioning the, 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 the all reports coming from science, but also from uh, the European, the, the international institutions like UNEP. The messages are clear. I mean, the, also the messages coming from the uh, uh, IPS is, are very clear. The IPC are very clear, but we need to be, I mean, I think that, we need to be aware that these messages are real, are important. I would, we, we need to understand what they really mean. We need to make the link, the real link between what this report says, says in terms of biodiversity laws, etc., and our actions in at the regional, at the local, regional, and national level. And I have the feeling. The personal feeling that sometimes there is no connection between the facts and the action. Although we all agree and we all make the speeches and articles speaking about what about what this report said, but then we need, uh, I mean, policy coherence, coherence between the facts and the action, and this is why we are very interested and we are, I mean, this is why we saw. Uh, in December 2019, the European Green Deal as, a, as a, an instrument for hope in terms of sustainable development. And this is why we are, we are working hard 
on this uh, on the implementation of, of the European Green Deal at the uh, regional level by making sure that we are transversal. So this means also some uh, a very important change in the way that public administration works. Mm -hmm. And it, how public administration work means how different sectoral ministries decide or understand that they need to cope instead of defending their individual interest. And then it is also uh, a very important, I mean, we are really aware and we had to, 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 to work in the, in, on this direction that public administration, I mean, governments cannot deal with this transition without taking into account, without cooperating with the stakeholders. So this, this, is, this is why I, I, would, to, to, I would like to underline that the importance of, uh, of private-public partnerships in order to make sure that everyone is engaged. And this means also a revolution in terms of, particip of public participation, where, because, public because administration, public administration usually works from a very uh, top-down perspective in terms of dealing with this, this involving people. And we are using participation most, more as, more as a, a legitimatory tool than a tool for provoking real change. And this is also part of this transition, how we work with it. And obviously, at the end, it's important for us to, 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 to see this vertical coordination. So regions are active. I'm quite, when I saw that the, the figures, I mean, in the poll about how people perceive the importance of regions in the in the in the I mean, in, in reaching the climate change goals i mean i was surprised regions have a lot of competencies a lot of responsibilities uh and it was i mean it obviously it's the the opinion of, of the of the attendants but regions have competencies on transportation on agriculture on waste etc etc et so we are really responsible for this decision magnus this is all from my side yeah thank you very much um, i know a very interesting contribution uh, let's continue to 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 uh, and give the floor to miss uh, eva hallstrom from the county of, uh, uh, county councillor uh, uh, from varmland uh, region and the chair of the AER working group on, on uh, energy and climate change. So, uh, Hallström, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, Magnus. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, the webinar that OER held for uh, some days ago. It was the role of regions uh, on imp improving energy efficiency. And my questions to the other speakers is, how do you see on energy efficiency and how can you work a lot more of this? Because uh, on this webinar, we talked about uh, the bioeconomic regions, the work together. And I come from a region, Värmland, where we have worked on energy efficiency and uh, have reduced our energy in our uh, buildings and that is done in few years and in some areas we have reduced our greenhouse emissions by 70 percent as seven zero percent and it's done and because we have so uh, good uh, people they know know how to do and how to work with energy efficiency and while you are working with energy efficiency you take the low hanging fruits and you save energy you save money and you save environment as well and so my, much of these um, uh, things that we have done have a payback time for three months some of them some are longer but that is the first thing you should think about is energy efficiency and uh, for this purpose we didn't have any uh, funding because we did it by ourselves because we see that was a good solution and then i know young people would love to work on energy efficiency because they see the possibility and the same goes for the industry as well so we have also clusters from industry that waste 
from a, an industry is uh, a sort of source in the next industry. So you could have lots of good innovations and that was very good. And I think, how will you uh, work on this topic? And I also see that you can, by doing this in energy efficiency, you also reach the goals in Agenda 2030. And uh, that is goal seven, affordable and clean energy. Number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure. And 11, sustainable citizens and com communities. And responsible consumption and production. And of course, number 13, climate action. And we're talking about action. So we, we in the region, uh, Badamland, we have done actions and we are now moving forward. So we are welcome people to come and see how we are working. Thank you. How will you work on energy efficiency? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hallström. And let's go to the chair of the EIA working group on, on uh, transportation and mobility. Uh, uh, Mr. Martin Tolén, uh, County Councillor in uh, Region Östergötland. And uh, on the 17th June, there will be organized uh, online debate on uh, carbon neutral mobility and improved ac uh, accessibility. Uh, but I give the floor to Mr. Tolén. Thank you, Magnus. And the key word in the event on the 17th of June is mass mobility as a transport, and you're all very welcome to join at that event. Um, I, before, I, I have two questions um, directed to Vista Malinowska and to Dominic Riquet. But before I ask my questions, may, maybe I could answer one. Um, as the chair of the working group on transport and mobility, I can comment on one part of Nina Klein's question in the chat, why there is no working group on the issues discussed today. Regarding climate change, I think that might be uh, two important questions to be handled by one working group. I think every one of us as chairs of IR, IR's different working groups need to take our part in the responsibility to address climate change. And as I will discuss in a moment, transport uh, is one very important area and therefore climate change is also one very important subject for the working group on transport and mobility. Um, as local and regional governments, we have a key role to play in the shift that is needed. That is why we are happy to see that transport is a vital part of the European Green Deal and the role of local and regional authorities in building that low carbon future is acknowledged in the sustainable and smart mobility strategy. We, as regions, we are ready to do our share. However, for us to undertake our role in making mobility more sustainable, we need to be fully involved in the design and implementation of those national plans and programs. And those funding opportunities must be more accessible to local or regional authorities. In order to be meaningful for regions, the sustainable and smart mobility strategy also needs to be implemented in a harmonized way with other relevant policies. One topic of great relevance, especially for regions in the Nordic countries, is the problem with only looking at emissions by measuring tailpipe values instead of the life cycle efficiency of a fuel called well to wheel and the consequences for the use of biogas and other biofuels in transportation and in other areas. Electrification of vehicles risks to be a single-sided way forward. That is one very important solution, but also with some drawbacks. Even though in the most positive scenarios, a great part of the electricity production within the European Union will be done by non-renewable sources. And even with a quick transition to electrical vehicles, the current fleet of vehicles will continue to exist for years to come. 
a transition from fossil fuel to biofuel in existing vehicles is a low hanging fruit, enabling a quick transition utilizing the existing fleet. So my question to Ms. Visnar Malinowska, uh, what policy actions is the DG Klima taking also alongside other European Commission departments in decarbonizing the European transport sector and building a sustainable, smart, accessible, multi-level transport system? And to Mr. Dominic Riquet, as you said in your presentation, the change will not look the same in all regions. And as a representative of Europe's different regions, we totally agree. How could we avoid a one size fits all where we miss the opportunity to utilize biofuels in those parts of Europe where it is a potential to increase the biofuel production without other negative environmental effects? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tolén. I will try to fit three more uh, contributions, if we keep them short, and then we will go to the speakers afterwards. So first, uh, I will give the floor to Kenneth uh, Johansson, um, who's a member of the AER Equal Opportunity Group and counselor uh, from Värmland. So I give the floor to you. Mr. Thank you very much. So, uh, what does climate change have to do with gender equality? Very much so. Uh, both in Sweden and in the rest of the world, when climate change, uh, living conditions change as well. It hits both men and women hard. Climate change is hitting hardest on women living in poverty. If you look more closely at climate change, you see that uh, men and women contribute differently uh, to, to uh, gas emissions through different consumption patterns and lifestyle choices. Men and women are also hit differently by climate change and do not have the same opportunity for adaption. In addition, the poor are the hardest hit and the vast majority of the world poorest are actually women. It is uh, usually the women who save, uh, ha have the task of fetching firewood and water from the family's household. Uh, when the draft comes, it gets harder and they have to go further and further away to be able to find enough water and firewood. Uh, in Sweden, uh, is, is there any differences between the sexes here, you might think? Well, men and women's lifestyle, behaviors and consumption patterns look different and they also have different impacts on the environment. Take transportation, for example. Uh, uh, men uh, uh, use, th their private transports uh, emit twice as much carbon dioxide as women's transports. And men eat more meat than women, which also contributes to the greenhouse effect. Globally, transport accounts for about 19% of global energy and the meat production for about 18%. Women around the world uh, are very important food producers. Uh, and they also, to a greater extent than men, directly dependent on natural resources from forest ag and agriculture. And uh, as uh, the weather gets uh, drier and rains becomes more uh, irregular and unpredictable, uh, everyone is affected, but women are hardest hit. Although women dominate as a labor force in agriculture, they do not own land to the same extent as men, which makes them more vulnerable. Women dominate in uh, many occupations, such as wild plant collectors, gardeners and herbalists, uh, activities that require specific knowledge of nature. Uh, not least women from indigenous people have important traditional knowledge of uh, animal and plants in their vicinity. Therefore, women also need to play an important role in the conservation of biodiversity and valuable natural resources. When men and women live equally in society, there is no difference in how they are affected by natural disasters. But when women do not have the same social and economic rights as men, there are many examples of uh, mortality among women uh, being greater in the climate uh, disasters and extreme weather, uh, such as hurricanes and heat waves. Women have uh, fewer assets, such as money and land, to restart after the, the disaster. They have less access to information and news channels that warns of a disaster. 
In the preamble of the Paris Agreement, parties acknowledged the importance of pronouncing gender equality and the empowerment of women when taking climate actions. For example, improved understanding of the gendered uh, impacts of climate change. Climate action, mitigation, adaptation, technology transfer, finance and capacity building informed by the experience of women. Women's participation in climate change related decision making at all levels. And gender strategies in legislation, policy making, programming and other activities related to climate change. And now to my question to, to Mrs. Safra, Safrankova. Uh, how can we ensure that the national and local plans to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement take account of gender inequalities and promote real gender responsive climate action? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johansson. And let's go to, uh, let me invite Mr. Victor Bagon, uh, Director at the EU <laughs> Office at the uh, State Government of Lower Austria. Uh, the region sharing the AR task force on digitalization. I'm I'm a little bit unsure if I pronounce your name right. So <laughs> please. Do. Well, thank you, Magnus, uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, for having us. Uh, thank you, AR, for this timely event. That we believe that regions will be crucial <clears throat> um, if we want to um, um, capture and and and. and and achieve our digital and, and uh, well, our digital and green uh, transition. And uh, why I would like to highlight, because there is an inherent nexus between uh, the green and the digital transitions, including the power of digital technology on the one hand to accelerate climate action. On the other hand, uh, we need to ensure that uh, digitalization also stays environmental sustainable. Um, definitely everywhere across uh, the continent, digitalization has a a big role to play in the green transition and also in the in the recovery after the pandemic uh, and uh, i think it has a great potential in order to change the way energy transportation building sectors uh, renovation now with the upcoming renovation wave for example um, can contribute uh, to greater productivity efficiency and uh, in order to make the transition a process uh, that creates a win-win situation a positive outcome both for the environment as well uh, as our economy. However, if you want to make the, uh, if you want to create digital opportunities and uh, uh, make it usable in delivering a fair and, and, and green transition, there's uh, two points in our, in our opinion uh, that we need to address uh, in particular. First of all, uh, the still existing digital urban rural gap. Uh, we believe that uh, we need to, it would be important to address uh, the territorial digital divides and uh, ensure the digital connectivity with broadband and infrastructure across uh, rural areas uh, and territories that uh, still contain about 30% of, of uh, the European Union's population. As well, um, another thing that we need to, to address in our opinion is uh, a certain digital skills gap. Uh, starting with people like uh, my age, about about around 40 digital skills. We're not, uh, we, we didn't grow up with digital skills, and but they, we all know they are vital uh, for every sector in, of the economy and, and, and all parts of society, uh, and will be key enablers necessarily uh, for a fair and green transition. Therefore, um, we, uh, we must look into how to improve those digital skills uh, via the vocational training, for example, so that uh, really nobody is left behind and not only those digital natives will be able to profit from a digital uh, transition. Um, I think uh, we are uh, on the right path in tapping into digital technologies to accelerate the transition, even though it's only the beginning of, of a marathon, so to speak. And uh, in order to finish this marathon, uh, we believe that uh, national governments must also embed rural digitalization strategies in their overall plans, in their overall digitalization plans, as well as uh, the recovery plans that, that were recently turned in. And uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, well, support uh, local and as well as national governments, uh, I have the following question from, uh, for uh, the European Commission, uh, respectively. Um, how is the European Commission and, and especially the climate adaptation adaption strategy, uh, envisioning support for local and regional governments 
so that we can actually really create uh, this win-win situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let me uh, ask um, now uh, John Allen County to, to take the floor. I know that we have both Mr. Brian Cannon and uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Edwin uh, Healy. Uh, so I, I, I think it was um, Mr. Brian yeah. that took the floor. So if I give the floor to you and you will be this last person to give a contribution. So take the floor. Um, th thank you, Magnus, <clears throat> and uh, thank you for facilitating our participation in today's debate. It's clear that we face a variety of impacts and challenges related to climate, that we do hold a common commitment to ensure that our regions grasp the opportunity for a green recovery. I represent Donegal County Council, and I would like to tell you about our region, our climate challenges, and the climate action we are taking. Donegal County Council is a local authority responsible for the county of Donegal in North West Ireland. Donegal has a population of 160,000 people. Our largest outlet are Kenny, which has a population of 20,000 people. And over 70% of our population live in rural areas outside of our main towns. Donegal is over 1,100 kilometres of coastline, which represents more than 15% of the total coastline of Ireland. A large proportion of our population live within five kilometers of the sea. Donegal shares 93% of its land border with Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom. And we only share nine kilometers of a land border with the rest of Ireland. From an adaptation perspective, the principal challenges that Donegal faces include the need to adapt to coastal erosion and flooding caused by more frequent severe storm events and rising sea levels, drier, hotter summers, which may increase instances of drought, and whilst more intense periods of rainfall, they also lead to more flood events. The fact that we have a dispersed population means that in many ways our mitigation challenges are accentuated. Our population is very dependent on private cars and heavy goods vehicles for transport, with 44% of our carbon emissions associated with transport, and another 50% of our carbon emissions are associated with heating, our residential and commercial buildings. So what have we done in Donegal in relation to climate action? Well, we're doing a number of things. In essence, all of these initiatives are framed within a statement of intent for the green transformation, which we have adopted in partnership with a neighboring local authority in Northern Ireland. This initiative is guided by the UN Sustainable Development Goals and is set within the pillars of the EU Green Deal. It looks to maximize the opportunity for utilizing green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. And it sets out to build a sustainable and circular economy with a diverse farm to fork food-based system. We have developed a regional energy strategy and plan to establish an energy agency to drive the decarbonization of the region. We've adopted our adaptation strategy in September, 2019, and are engaged in rolling out 72 actions across the themes of critical buildings and infrastructure, natural and cultural capital, water resources and flood risk management, and community services. We are also developing a climate action plan to build climate resilience and the capacity to contribute to mitigation in our communities and businesses. The restrictions imposed by COVID-19 pandemic have also presented opportunities. It has shown us that we can be flexible and we can change. It has shown us we can work remotely without the need to commute for work. The lockdowns in particular, the restrictions that have limited um, travel outside of one's own local area has also built an awareness and appreciation in local environment and how individuals can protect, restore and enhance it. I found today's discussion very interesting and at Donegal, we hope to collaborate with other regions to share best practice and maximize opportunities to bring benefits to our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now like to give the floor to, to our speakers to respond on, on, on this wide range of, of questions. But as I said before, we have talk, been talking about everything from the moon and back. So that's, that's uh, 
probably rather natural. But uh, I know that we are uh, getting close to the end of, of the session, but perhaps we have the possibility to, to, to pass, the, pass the line uh, with a few minutes. I, I would like to give the floor for you, for you to, to have the possibility to, to respond. So let, let me start by giving the floor to, 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 um, to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Safrankova. Um, if you would like to say a few words in, in response to your questions or in the comments. Thank you. Um, there were lots of very, very interesting points and comments and uh, I, I have several pages uh, filled uh, now, so I will not be able to react to everything, but uh, I will start with um, Arno, uh, that wasn't actually a question to me, but uh, um, that's something that uh, I very appreciated what he mentioned about uh, the science uh, that uh, should be uh, embedded in the uh, uh, planning um, and, uh, and also the, the decision making uh, on all levels, including the regional level. Uh, I would also make the hint what uh, um, Elena was mentioning in her intervention in terms of the planning that is really up, uh, crucial to uh, to to integrate uh, also the project cycle. I think that we have uh, lots of representatives on, on this uh, uh, call uh, dealing with uh, really specific uh, actions uh, in, in regions and, uh, um, and uh, local authorities uh, dealing with projects funded uh, through different financial instruments. But it's really important that uh, the, there is uh, the, uh, in the, on the example of sustainable infrastructure, uh, to to integrate both the science, the needs, um, um, and uh, yeah, the data uh, into uh, also the project cycle uh, before actually the the project uh, uh, phase starts. So to have a long term, medium and long uh, long term uh, plans uh, that are based on science. Um, so that was uh, one of the things I wanted to appreciate, the mention of, of science. Uh, I was also quite uh, struck by the, the poll on um, uh, the responsibility on, on climate. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, if I would, uh, would um, give my response, uh, I, I certainly believe that all the stakeholders that were mentioned, there are, all of us are responsible, whether it's international organizations, uh, in the European context, uh, the EU, uh, uh, governments, regional authorities, local authorities, academic sector, uh, financial institutions, um, business. So we, uh, we all have our role to play and individuals. And that's one thing uh, uh, without delaying too much is to mention that actually we have to realize that, uh, that we as individuals, we have a really uh, impact actually. And we can control uh, from our way of life, uh, our behavior, uh, attitudes, uh, how what well, emissions we produce. Two thirds of global emissions are linked to households. It's uh, the mobility, residential, and food sectors. They contribute about 20% of lifestyle emissions. So it's 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 a big proportion. So we cannot uh, we cannot put all the responsibility on the governments. The governments uh, set the legislative and strategic framework, but then it's uh, all of all of the parts that, that we need to take the action. So that's um, also, I think, what Arno was mentioning. Uh, on Eva's uh, question on the energy efficiency, uh, very briefly, uh, it's true, it's, uh, it's really important uh, part. Um, and uh, Eva, you mentioned that the low hanging fruit, there is, uh, I don't have the numbers in my head, but uh, there is, uh, we have been talking for, about this for, for years, that there is still huge potential in energy efficiency. Um, so uh, both in terms of uh, buildings, but also um, uh, uh, infrastructure, um, uh, lots of different uh, areas. Uh, in terms of what we do, uh, so UNEP, uh, as such, uh, we uh, we are working with uh, with governments, uh, local authorities to uh, to to support uh, the, the, uh, the the different ways and the different measures that uh, that are uh, that the countries do. Uh, we also are um, engaging in uh, uh, strengthening the business case uh, for energy efficiency in development and, uh, uh, and emerging economies. Um, what, what is also important part is uh, the, the, also our engagement in cross-cutting work on uh, energy efficiency finance uh, with uh, investors, uh, banks and insurers. Uh, so also another important element. 
uh, on uh, Kenneth, uh, thank you so much for mentioning uh, gender inequality. This is really important uh, part, especially in the connection of climate uh, crisis. We are doing um, a lot of work with other UN agencies, uh, looking at uh, uh, especially uh, uh, links with um, uh, gender inequality, uh, in, in say also security and, and peacekeeping uh, uh, co uh, context. Uh, so there is uh, still a lot, a lot to do, but you mentioned interestingly also in the European region, there's still a thing, uh, a, a potential to do more to integrate uh, this uh, question into uh, both policy making and also uh, programming um, as well. Um, and uh, there was something else that I uh, noted down, but um, uh, I don't want to delay any further. So I may th think of uh, other points, but. Uh, very fascinating debate and uh, I, I, I would be very happy to continue the discussion also bilaterally so if somebody would be interested for a little bit more in-depth uh, talk uh, I would be definitely up for it. Thank you Magnus. Thank you very much, thank you for, for that. Perhaps I can give the floor to, to, to uh, Mr. Rikir uh, if you would like to address the audience. Yeah, well, I, I will be very shortly because uh, I'm a, a little bit sorry uh thank you it was very interesting and uh, very rich uh, intervention and i think that uh, the, the different uh, speaker underlined very well the real importance of the regional level about a lot of, a lot of concerns um it's very difficult to transfer to all what was uh, uh, on the table but uh, I want to uh, just say about energy uh, energy efficiency. Right? I share the position of Eva. It's a very important point, and very efficiency uh, is very uh, effective in, in a regional level. And I think that the best energy is the energy we have not uh, expanded in this clear. And I, uh, I learned it's a very important point. I think it's the future in the in the next regulation. Um, I was very interested by the, 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 the topic of a gender equality in the transport because it's absolutely unknown. You know. For us, it's not a topic, and I think it's probably something very important. Uh, the more the, the society is developed, probably uh, the more the, 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 this concern is uh, undermined. But I think that in general, in the world, it could be very important because I think that the situation of the women are not the same at all of the men, the gender difference about transportation. And I think it could be very important when we are talking about uh, radio. And uh, I, I, play, I play guilty. We have no reflection about this kind of point of view in the transportation in the, my commission, in my committee. We'll see. It's very very interesting by, by that. Uh, about the question which was for me uh, uh, about transport, uh, we have with my colleague of the transport committee in the region, uh, the region committee, uh, we, we have a lot of common problems. And I think at first, uh, the question uh, the difference between tail peak uh, versus life cycle. It's uh, a question for the specialist, but I think when we are talking about the green point of view, probably uh, the good and the more simple, uh, the more simple uh, method is uh, about telepic uh, emission because for the rest it's too complex to have something very efficient with the life cycle of the will to telepic uh, solution. Uh, about uh, the existing fleet, and the remaining thermic uh, Call fleet uh, uh, along the, the, the reform. Probably uh, it's remained a lot of thermic cars uh, in Europe for 20 or perhaps more years. And it will be also a problem of disparity between West and East because a part of the thermic fleet of the West is uh, is a in, the, in the East part of Europe and remain probably for a lot. And so it's a real problem uh, to, to save the uh, technical neutrality. It's uh, something very important for the future in the, in the um, 
thermal shift of the uh, road transportation. And uh, we have was, uh, also to take in account uh, some other solution or transitional solution, such as biofuel, but probably uh, our future uh, will be uh, electric. And I say it's more difficult in the east part of Europe. It's more difficult for the uh, uh, more developed, uh, less developed uh, region uh, in Europe. And so we have to attempt to mix something which could be efficient to have not a good result in the part of Fraser of the Europe, for example, and a very, good, a very bad result in other parts because uh, our uh, general, uh, general uh, result about uh, emission is uh, from, for, for Europe as a whole and not for uh, east part, west part, poor part, and rich part. It's something that we have to consider all the, the road uh, transportation as a whole. And uh, finally, uh, I think we have also just, we have no word about that, but I think I want to underline uh, it could be important to have an inter regional and cross border cooperation. Because I think that often is something about a struggle between the local and regional level and the national level. And it's not the case. We have also to put in place cooperation operation at transborder level and I think it's also a very important point and uh, often in the struggle between regional and national uh, level we are um, not in, in uh, we, 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 are, we have not in place a sufficient transborder cooperation. Uh, I, I could be uh, have a lot of uh, remarks to do but I think I remain uh, as such because we have no more time but Thank you very much. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll give the floor to Mr. Griffroy. Uh, if you would like to say a few words, I know that you are in a hurry. Yes, thank you. I'm in a hurry. Um, but I want to answer on the question of the energy efficiency. I found that very important because for me, in the Trias Energetica, this is the first level, your energy efficiency. So this is the first step. Well, this and I give you three points where you can work on it. First of all, I found that the local government has to give the good example. For example, if you look to our town hall, this is an old fashioned building with an old fashioned climate installation, uh, simple windows, etc., etc. But they are promoting then energy efficiency by the private people, but you cannot promote something to the private people if you do, don't do it by, your, by yourself. So that's first thing. Second thing, learning network and best practices. I had once that I was on a terrace of a pub before COVID, and this guy was saying, oh, you know, maybe I can use some, um, some, uh, some, some hot, no, some sun collector for my hot water production. But you know, I, I don't have the experience with that. And I don't know what is the best system. But maybe if you can then support them and only install, for example, one installation in one pub, and then other pubs can come look to this one pub and say, okay, it's working, so I have to do it also in my own pub. Yeah? Then that's what I want to say with learning network with best practices. And third is, works with one center back office with one point of contact. Yeah? Because if you talk with people, they say there's so many information, there's so many sites where you can find things about supporting, etc., 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 but you have to focus on one central point in your administration, etc., on in your administration on local level, not on your national level, because this distance is too big for the for the evidence. You have to go to the local level and focus on one central back office with one uh, point of contact. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, finally, I would like to give the floor also to, to Vishnar Malinkovska, uh, if you also want to make a few remarks on the comments. Thank you very much. There were two uh, questions that were specifically uh, addressed to me first on transport. What is DG Klima doing uh, on, on transport? Well, first of all, we participate every year in the inter-institutional competition on cycling in May and we uh, win <laughs> in the commission. 
Uh, this year we were second, but we were we are very happy that the Director General for Maritime Affairs has uh, actually, you know, uh, won this year. Very proud. It shows that a, a bigger DG can uh, can make it. Second, uh, now, uh, you know, this is about employees' engagement, and I think it's super important because, as, as, as was said, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, you need to walk the talk and, and you cannot request the others doing from uh, something you, you don't do uh, at home. Uh, second, we, uh, DG Klima is in charge of CO2 standards for vehicles uh, already for several years and, and you know that by tightening these standards we actually come to a moment uh, where indeed the technological choices are being challenged. <laughs> of course, you need to go for more innovation and uh, the classical uh, combustion engine as we know it uh, will be uh, indeed squeezed but it's, it's for the interest of the humanity, I hope, and of our health uh, when it comes to air quality. Infrastructure, we very much uh, promoted the, the charging point, uh, the new infrastructure, uh, but uh, at the same time, re utilization of the infrastructure that is out there. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, you know, make any uh, sort of uh, uh, surprises here, uh, there, is, there, there is legacy infrastructure that could be used uh, for the future for, for, for instance, for renewable gases uh, and so on. Um, an additional uh, point on climate pact, we are trying to go beyond policies and legislation. Individual action has been featured here as, as very important. As you know, very difficult to um, put at EU level obligations to individuals, but it's, it's also good to create this sort of social movement for individual action that makes a difference and mobility is definitely uh, there. On digital, you know, what uh, kind of uh, budgets are on offer for, for the uh, digital transition? Well, we have the classical budgets we use, the, the cohesion policy, now the recovery resilience uh, facility, but for the digital slash green and digital in support of green transition, uh, you can definitely use also digital Europe. We've tried to put uh, there in the work program uh, possibilities for public-private partnerships, uh, mostly on data sharing, for instance, for better climate projections. So you prepare your uh, decision makers and, and your uh, you know, cities uh, better. Um, there are ideas about so-called uh, digital twins. So if I'm a city, if I'm a suburb, I can actually uh, do a digital representation of, of my uh, part of, of the city. And I can see, you know, what a climate hazard would mean uh, for this in a relatively safe, uh, safe space. Um, there was also a question on energy efficiency. I agree with all what, what has been said. We still have a legacy issue with buildings. Uh, just take hospitals, schools, ministries, um, cultural heritage. Not easy to turn it all into a, a well-insulated building. I also think that we too much are focused on primary energy demand in a building. Uh, and we should know that the building is more than that. For instance, for water using uh, uh, you know, tools, you still need to pump electricity and this doesn't count into the sort of energy profile of a building. We need also to uh, improve the uh, skills on the side of controllers, the auditors, the energy managers uh, that should be, you know, always present in the city councils as, as a sort of job <laughs> for, for allowing, uh, you know, uh, really checking and monitoring whether our buildings, uh, you know, become uh, energy uh, efficient. And finally, uh, a point on, on gender equality, can't agree more. Uh, and uh, I must say, it's not anymore uh, just a, a least developed countries uh, concept as, as we used to see it from, from the international settings. 
we see it more and more uh, if a disaster hits in Europe uh, we see uh, that uh, you know the compensation that goes sometimes to men or to women is different uh, there are examples even from the US uh, where you know race is a difference uh, so so uh, uh, there is a question of, of racial justice that will come also to Europe and will be uh, very uh, present uh, also but indeed uh, climate uh, the climate adaptation strategy puts uh, the narrative and this issue clearly on the table we are not hiding it and uh, we acknowledge the different impacts and, and we try to uh, you know start to have a conversation a proper conversation in the setting of the just transi uh, resilience so stay tuned uh, stay with us and and please uh, come with uh, with the issues as they arise thank you thank you very much thank you everyone for taking part in this event i'm i'm sure that uh, the question about who's responsible for for the climate action if we had put the choice all of the above i think after this uh, event i think everyone would have pushed that bottom in, instead I, i'm sure that we we all feel the responsibility here from all different levels and we need to work together so let me just thank all our speakers and on the audience for 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 the attention and the active participation i'm sure that there will be a lot of following up after these because we have learned a lot thank you very much everyone have a nice day